Hey, it's, uh, it's been a long time since I recorded a video, so um, I thought this would be something nice just to get back into the swing of it, um, as I've been going over this <coughs> today. <coughs> so I thought it'd be nice to go over some uh, some quick definitions, really. Um, this is pretty, pretty simple, um, um, so it'd be great if you're just kind of starting this topic or um, wanting to get back into it, just like me, really, or um, just recap. Um, otherwise, you probably will want to move on from this. Um, if you already know it, you're smarter than me. <laughs> but yeah, some simple definitions. So um, often, uh, often you'll hear people in medicine talking about epidemiology and public health, and these are two nice uh, little definitions I've heard for the two. So basically, the definition of epidemiology is um, it's the study of the determinants and distribution of disease. Like nice and easy to remember, determinants and distributions, distribution of disease. That's what epidemiology is all about. So the three Ds, um, and public health is all about the three Ps. So um, public health is the science, if you like, of um, prolonging life, of preventing disease, and of promoting health. So that's what um, public health is all about. Doing those three things. So just. Yeah, I just thought they were really cool definitions, nice and easy to remember. Um, stop us getting confused and stuff like that. Another thing I wanted to um, kind of talk about is uh, disease prevention, um, primary prevention, um, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. Um, a lot of definitions for these, I, personally, I find it a bit, a bit confusing. Um, so I just I'm just sharing with you here really how I think about them. So I think of primary prevention as basically being precautions, taking precautions. So that's basically removing um, anything that could predispose uh, our patient to a disease. So a primary prevention could be, for example, safe sex, wearing condoms, um, or the HPV vaccine, and using either one of those to say... Uh, uh, prevent someone being predisposed to cervical cancer because HPV infection has been associated with cervical cancer so if we immunize someone or we promote uh, safe sex we can stop that exposure we can stop the spread of um, HPV and hopefully bring down cervical cancer rates so that would be an example of say a primary prevention a secondary prevention would be um, treating actual risk factors so this would be like, um, keeping with the same example, this would be like uh, running a screening program, um, cervical smears or something like that. And when we detect abnormalities, um, growth abnormalities in the cervix, precancerous abnormalities, we treat the precancerous abnormalities. So we're not treating an actual disease, we're treating an abnormality that has been associated with going on to be disease. Um, if you understand what I'm saying. Um, so that would be like a, a secondary prevention. Uh, a, a tertiary prevention, you've probably guessed it already, that would be treating actual disease. So that's our person's already got cervical cancer and we're now doing cancer treatment. So I just I just like these definitions. Um, I'll talk a bit more about it, give some more examples. Um, so something else like a primary prevention for disease could be um, recommending good lifestyle advice. So, you know, a low, a low fat diet, not having too much uh, fat, red meat, regularly exercising, um, public health strategies to um, provide disincentives for smoking. These are all primary preventions, really, of disease. So we're dealing with precautions. We're not dealing with actual sick people. We're dealing with the things that um, we believe um, cause disease. Um, another example of a secondary prevention, treating actual risk factors. So this would be like um, a patient comes in, we test them, and they have high um, cholesterol levels in their blood. So we choose to put them on statins in the absence of disease. Um, doctors, doctors do this quite a lot at the moment. Um, so a person has no disease, no problems. They, they only have high blood cholesterol in the absence of disease, hyperlipidemia. And we choose to treat them with statins. So that's an example of a, a secondary prevention. We're treating a risk factor for disease. Um, 
high blood cholesterol can is related to things like uh, heart disease. So we're treating the high blood cholesterol. There's no heart disease. And the tertiary prevention, we, someone comes in with heart disease, we're now treating the actual heart disease. So that's kind of how I think about the three. One's precaution, one's treating the risk factors of, that, of a disease, and one's treating an actual disease. Um, I've never heard it defined that way, but um, I think it's way better than anything I've heard. It's way, way less confusing. Um, I hope it's right. <laughs> um, if I'm wrong... I will get a comment telling me off, um, as I have done in the past. Um, but I'm pretty sure I've understood that correctly. Something else I wanted to go over quickly, I've got a bit of time, is um, the Bradford Hill criteria. Now, Bradford Hill, um, epidemiology, we hear about this all the time in med school and um, in medicine. And when we think something causes a disease, um, so we're talking about causation now of disease. So there's something we think causes disease, so like we... We think, um, I mean, I'm going back in time now. Let's imagine we're back in time and we think smoking causes disease. Well, we can put it through a little test, something called the Bradford Hill criteria. Impossible to remember these criteria um, because there's so many of them. So I've made it into a mnemonic, Bradford Hill criteria. And the mnemonic is Bradford. Check that out. Um, so the B stands for biologically plausible. So is it actually biologically plausible based on, on, on scientific understanding that smoking, that whatever it is we think causes a disease? Um, so in the case of smoking, yes, it is biologically plausible. Um, we have a good knowledge of uh, mutagens um, that can cause cancer. Um, many of them are found in cigarettes, you know, things like polyaromatic hydrocarbons and other things. So it's biologically plausible there is material in, in cigarette smoke that can damage DNA um, and damage DNA often um, is the start, um, not well, I don't know, a bit unfair to say often, but um, damage DNA um, is the start of um, cancer. Um, it's a starting process of, of, of uh, cancer as far as I know. Um, R we look at um, reverse causality. So this is an interesting one. Reverse causality is all about cause and effect. So we have something we think is a cause and we have the effect, which is basically disease. So is what we, th is this causing the disease or have we got our cause and effect mixed up is our cause actually the effect so in other words does this sorry this camera is awful um in other words does this cause this or are we being misled is this actually the cause and this actually the effect so i'll give you this is like chicken and egg so does smoking cause cancer or does cancer cause smoking? That's a bad example, but um, you see what I mean. Another one might be, um, does hypertension cause diabetes? Or does diabetes cause hypertension? Is part of the disease process of diabetes what causes the hypertension? Or is it the hypertension that causes the disease? So this is reverse causality. So we check that that isn't happening. There's studies that we can do to do this. Um, to check reverse causality. Um, one of them is um, we can look at a bunch of people with diabetes um, with a disease without what we think is a risk factor and watch them to see if they develop high blood pressure and then we can get a bunch of people with hypertension but no diabetes and watch them to see if they develop diabetes. So that would that can help us sort out this order, find out what's the cause and what's the effect. The next one's um, A, association. Now basically, um, association, it's all about the strength of association and the easiest way to think about this is when we've got a high relative risk, so where relative risk is high, um, we basically have little doubt that there is no association between what we're querying as a cause and the actual disease. Um, I'm gonna leave that at that really. D is for definite, 
So basically, um, is what we think is the cause of the disease. Um, it's about the disease exposure combination. So is there a strong association um, correlation between what we think is the cause and what is the disease? You know, how definite is this? Are our findings definite? Are they specific? Um, however, this is kind of an interesting one because in my reading I found that if you lack this, if there isn't this um, specificity here, it doesn't necessarily mean it isn't causal. So all this one does is increase, it can increase uh, the likelihood that it is causal, but it can't really decrease it. So a bit of an odd one. Um, I don't think I've explained that too well. Um, yeah, OK, I'm going to move on because I'm stuck for time. Um, F is for faithful. So are our findings faithful to what has been found in other studies? As simple as that. That's what faithful is. O is for obscure. I've forgotten how to spell now. Oh, obscure, right. Obscure. Um, and that's basically, is there anything else obscuring the results? Is there anything mudging the water? So going back to our cause and effect, we might think this is the cause, but is there a confounder? basically another factor that is truly causing the disease something that we haven't found yet so we're looking at this thinking oh yeah this causes the disease and we haven't seen this something that's associated to what we think is the cause but is actually the true cause so an example of this would be we think alcohol causes lung cancer but actually smoking causes lung cancer and alcohol and smoking are associated because people who have a poor poor lifestyle who smoke who um, drink who drink more are likely to smoke more because the two go hand in hand. Um, that's an example. I'm not saying that's necessarily true. You know, I don't want loads of offended smokers having a go at me. I'm just making the point here. So you can see how the cause and the confound what we think is the cause and the confounder are related, and we can be misled. So the confounder is something that muds the water is there anything that muddies the water that obscures what we think finally is it reversible so this strongly suggests causality so if we take away cigarette smoking does that lower rates of lung cancer so that would suggest that it is causal and finally we've got dose response dose response nice and straightforward um, if we look at people who smoke and have lung cancer do people who smoke more have higher rates of lung cancer than people who smoke less. Um, so that's dose response. Anyway, nice mnemonic there, Bradford, to talk about the Bradford Hill criteria and a few definitions. I hope that's helpful.